Okay, you mentioned the Strugatskys, you mentioned Asimov, you mentioned Lester. Um, you've run into um, all sorts of people in the science fiction field. Who are the, um, well, let me, before I get to this part of the question, let me ask you about someone who was a good friend uh, who you often traveled with, Rusty Hevelin. Oh, yeah. Um, how did you guys get to meet Rusty? I remember. I guess uh, my brother first. Really? I think at conventions. He was selling yeah. books at conventions. He was, mm -hmm. friendly enough. he was shy. He would stand back against the wall. And, Rusty uh, was shy? Yes. I have to tell you why he was no longer shy. He, was, he would stand back against the wall. And he wouldn't talk to anybody. He'd stand there with him. I can see him with his hands in his pockets, watching the programming and stuff. So you know me, I can't let somebody be all by themselves. So I went up and started talking to him and laughed. We got to laughing and stuff. So we were all at a Shambanicon, and the and it, and it was time to get in the car and go home. It started to snow, and when we went out to get in the car, it was sheet ice. There was no way we were going to get home. So we went back into the hotel. They gave us another night. They gave the whole convention another night, opened up the party room. And so we spent that whole evening talking to Rusty. Mm -hmm. He was there and we were there. Got some of his history. It was quite a talk. Well, you push his on button. It didn't always go off. So, <laughs> so he would told us war stories, had great stories of World War II and his experiences. So then we saw him again at Torcon. Mm -hmm. 73 and 74 we saw him again at, no not Torcon it was it was after that anyway con confusion in January after that and um, spent quite a bit of time talking and he said you know there are only two states I haven't been to I haven't been to Maine and I haven't been to Alaska, Alaska. Mm -hmm. and we said let's go yep so we, we started to set up the Alaska trip and something happened and we couldn't do it so we went to Maine camping, camped and camped all over Maine and discovered that Joe and I did not bicker while Rusty was around. <laughs> Joe, Rusty was there as sort of a moderator. Mm -hmm. And whenever I'd get grouchy, he'd say, Joe, feed her something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we just, we traveled well together. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a cook. And Rusty actually loved doing uh, housekeeping stuff, like uh, he was you know, so helping set up the tents and kitchen and so forth and so on. He was very handy at that. So we teamed very well together. Yeah. And because he didn't, he was living on uh, Social Security, didn't have much income. We figured, well, you know, we can do this. So we got him to Maine. And then in 1990, I don't know what 91, I think we got to it, got him to Alaska. We spent six weeks traveling around Alaska. That was great. Yeah. Rusty was the biggest hit the Japanese tourists had ever seen <laughs> with his big white whiskers. <laughs> Every camera. Just a different finger. And, okay. uh, and he introduced us to all the old pulp people. The, uh, um, mm -hmm. I was trying to think of names, names, names. Um, people, his pulp con would bring people in and right. uh, and he uh um so he knew all these old time artists all these old time writers and whenever we were traveling somewhere he'd say so and so lives here and he'd give him a call and we'd go over and get to know him it was wonderful rusty was shy but when icon started he volunteered to do the the first huckster room and it was all these young women and they paid him a lot of attention. And he started to get more confident mm -hmm. and he, and more outgoing. And then they asked him to be Toastmaster. I don't think he could have done it five years before. Mm -hmm. And so he would, became Toastmaster and they became perennial Toastmaster. And then when Demicon started, he became their perennial Toastmaster. And he kind of found himself because of uh, the Iowa group. So we we're all involved in that. And we started camping all around the country. Uh, just we found out that we really enjoyed uh, going to campgrounds, setting up, and you know, going to various uh, touristy spots and things. So 
we started bringing Rusty along with us and we just sort of went from one part of the country to another and <laughs> uh, peripatetic. And then we decided Joe wanted to bicycle across the country. Yeah. I was not going to let him do that by himself. I was a bicycler, but not like he was. So we trained and we trained. We bought this old beat up RV. Rusty said, okay, he would drive it. And so he drive, drove our sag wagon while Joe and I bicycled across the country. Yeah. 1996, 97 and 98, we spent a month each year going a third of the, the way across. It's one of the things that reading can do to you because uh, <laughs> I had read a, a magazine article in I think Writer's Digest or something about a guy who put a typewriter on the back of his bicycle and rode all the way across the country writing magazine articles for the local papers. And I thought, well, hell, I can do that. <laughs> so I didn't quite do that. But in fact, they discovered computers somehow uh, in the meantime. And <laughs> so I, I could get online and send my articles and chapters and so forth around. And it was... <laughs> I'd be doing that still if I had to. <laughs> we enjoyed the trip so much and we were in such good shape by the time we got to San Diego. We went to yeah. St. Augustine, Florida to San Diego, California. By the time we got there, we were in pretty good shape. Yeah. I don't think Rusty was. He spent the whole time in the van reading. Yeah, right. But uh, we got to, we said, okay, we got some time. Shall we turn north and go up? And Rusty said, no, <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough now. <laughs> But you did get him to do something similar, didn't you, in Europe? He went with us yeah. in Holland before the WorldCon in 1990. Yeah. Tell, tell about the bicycle trip. Well, we, we bicycled, uh, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was more catch as catch can in Europe. We, we found that a lot of people bicycle across Europe, even without taking a bicycle of their own, because you can rent bicycles you know, for a thousand miles uh, through a organized, uh, I forget the name of it, but. Uh, we didn't do that though. But you didn't have to buy a bicycle. You no. could, uh, you could have one for a month or two and, and leave it at, 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 in another country and pick up another bicycle and keep going and everything. But we, I didn't know that. Yeah, we, it's interesting. We bicycled Holland. Um, mm -hmm before the Worldcon with the plan of ending up at the Worldcon where Joe was going to be guest of honor. And uh, Rusty went with us and then we said, now he was in his late fifties by then. And we weren't sure that he should do it. And he said, oh, I can do it. He did. He, we, he and I brought up the rear through the whole trip, but uh, we had a great time. We just had a great time. Yeah. I remember um, reading some of your descriptions of those as uh, uh, after you wrote them up for, uh, for various places. Yep. Yeah. yeah. He, he posted uh, on Genie all those. That is that where it was? Okay. I knew it was written up, but I couldn't remember where. Yeah. And we don't have it all. If anybody has it, I'd appreciate it. So if anyone has a, a Genie archive, they should let you know about it. Please. Okay. Um, now I was going to ask you about other personalities. You've met a variety of people through science fiction circles, fan circles. Um, and as I said, you had men uh, mentioned already um, briefly about um, Asimov and Clement and such. Um, what people stick out in your mind, still stick out in your mind uh, mm -hmm. as memorable and uh, interesting. Well, the whole Milford group was fascinating. Milford mm -hmm. science fiction yeah. writing uh, okay. workshop run by Damon Knight and Kate Wilhelm. And we actually kept going, we stayed friends with Damon and Kate for a long time after that. Forever. Yeah. Well, until he died, yeah. Gardner uh, Dozois introduced us to Damon and Kate. Yeah. Gardner was a strong influence. He was a new writer at the same time Joe was. Yeah. Gardner and I got together about the same time with uh, Jack Dan and my brother, Jack Haldeman. And I guess George Zabrowski was off on the side and uh, uh, 
Pamela Sargent. Pamela Sargent. And we just sort of hung around. In fact, we we did a, uh, what did we call it? It was a... Uh, what, Guilford Gaffia? No, we did a, uh, a, a, the kind of a fanzine where everybody writes uh, a sort of a diary. Naked and you, came the... Naked became the android. And and we'd, uh, you'd, you'd get all your pages together and send them to the next person. And oh, she would uh, put hers on top and take the uh, oldest one off the bottom and keep sending them around. What do they call those? They called it a link. We called link this letters. a link letter. Link letter. This okay. is a free computer. Yeah. It was a sort of a uh, precursor to a blog. I and believe George Martin was involved. Yeah, George Martin. Yeah, okay, so who else was that was fun. But Gardner was a strong influence as far as putting people together, getting yeah. getting us to letting us know people. And well, he was central to a lot of people's uh, professional and fanish lives. And Gardner was the big uh, glue for a lot of relationships. And Keith Lommer, uh, we met yeah. and got to know at the, Milford. At the that first Milford in the early 70s. 1970. Yeah. 1970. And he talked us into leaving Maryland after we graduated and going to Florida where he lived. Yeah. And right after we got there, he had a stroke. And so we took care of him for a while. Mm -hmm. I got a job teaching high school Spanish and, and Joe said, he, you know, said, I can, I can write. And we made a deal two years. We, he would write for two years and we would see if he made enough money and what the situation was. And I would teach for two years. By the end of the two years, we we're making the same money, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then we went off to Iowa, and I never had to had to go back to. She high never had teaching. to work again a day in her life by crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and you can quote me on that. <laughs> but we got to know Keith, and he was a good influence. He taught us to keep track of things. He taught us the business. Yeah, yeah, he was good at that. He was really good at the business, and he he said a cute thing. He said that he used different color paper for each draft or for each book. It was each book. Yeah. So he'd put in the typewriter, a yellow paper, and he'd write his story. So one time he put in pink paper and he got about halfway through the story and realized that aliens were pink and the, the land was pink, pink and the costumes were <laughs> pink. And he said, I can't do this. Yeah. He was a strange dude. He was a strange dude. A lot of his uh, writing, uh, writing habits had to do with... Uh, being lunatic. I mean, uh, I mean, yes. obsessive compulsive. And so, I, you know, I, I admired the tenacity and I had to recognize his huge success in writing, frankly, mediocre novels. Oh, did I say that? Yes. Uh, but he did so many of them and none of them were that bad. Oh, I and so I, th and some of them were pretty damn good. But I was impressed, not just because we lived right there, but how, how energetic and how successful he was. So I thought, you know, I will never be that way because I'm not, I'm not psychologically built up to be a successful person. I'm just <laughs> sort of a lazy person, actually. <laughs> but uh, you, you mean know, people are always telling you to write more? Yeah, some people do. Some people tell me to write less. <laughs> it wasn't them either. Joe is slow writer. Yeah, I'm slow. And uh, people say, you're so prolific. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm only prolific to people who don't know what a really prolific writer is. Because, you know, what was that noise? That's that somebody's like, Zoom. It's, oh. <laughs> uh, I thought it's that was a sister. prolific writer trying to get in. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not... Uh, I'm just normally prolific, which is <laughs> in my you're not, Yeah, you're not John Creasy or Isaac Asimov. No way, no. Thank goodness. But I can write a, a book every couple of years. Yeah. Well, other people, um, uh, Gordon R. Dixon, he was yeah. a strong influence too. He was good, good friend. Yeah. The, uh, Gordy was also uh, really um, enthusiastic about his Spanish connections yes. yeah, from, right. from the 40s on, actually. 
but um, uh, I don't think so. He was uh, Wendy. Mute yourself, please. Yes. <laughs> can can you? There you go. Okay, that's my sister. Yeah. She's oh. in another room in the hotel. <laughs> but uh, Gordy, Gordy was of really successful writers. He is the one that I would point to as being actually a friendly person. He he was not a weirdo. He just wrote and never quit. He just wrote so much because he had to write a lot. I think among non-science fiction writers, most writers who are successful don't do it by cranking out a certain number of words a day and actually just piling them up, but rather having a one really great book and then years later another really great book and this and that but most sci most science fiction writers i've known who are successful do it by slow accretion they mm -hmm. write a lot over the years and, and that's what i always thought i would be too but now at the close to the very end of a career it's been over 40 years i'd say you know, I haven't been that regular a writer because I have I have a number of books out, but most people who have been doing it for half a century have more than 50 books. And I, I don't even know how many I had. 30 something. 30 something. Yeah, that's close enough. But, may, may, you know, maybe it's 40. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Uh, George R. R. Martin was a good friend growing up. He, we met yeah. him in, when we were in Iowa, I think. He was in yeah. Chicago. Oh, we went to the WindyCon. Joe was the first guest of honor at the first WindyCon. That's something we didn't mention. Yeah. And he the, was like, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> it's been, uh, it, well, from 63 till now. Um, you still seem to be... Uh, well interested and involved in science fiction and the fandom that we have created what keeps you involved still what makes you get interact with various people hmm. Maybe besides your science fiction it's an inability to grow <laughs> <laughs> no i uh, i don't know partly it's stubbornness and partly it's an a uh, an, in a, an unwillingness to change Mm -hmm. It has worked so well for so long. Why should I do something differently? Okay. The thing okay. is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, well, both of us have come mixed and matched careers in literature and academia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we both taught, but we aren't the kind of people we know of as being professional teachers. We're sort of professional science fiction fans, and we know a few of them too. A lot of people would like to be that. Yeah, well, who would who who would want to knock themselves out with a job when you could be a fan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it keeps us. You know, we just keep on keeping on. We go yeah. to the conventions. We have a good time at the conventions. We're cutting back a little bit on the program obligations so we can enjoy our friends, but we're there. Yeah. People like to meet Joe. Mm -hmm. It's great. People like to meet you too. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I was going to say we've been going on over an hour on this. And um, uh, are there, uh, do we have some questions in the chat room, Edie? Do we have Dee? There's Dee Dee. She's looking. <clears throat> we don't have any yet, but now's a good time for everyone to put their questions in the chat. While everyone is doing that, um, Joe, I, I know that you used to get up in the in the early early time in the morning, and mm -hmm. you would start writing and and get all of your work done before everyone else woke up. Pretty much. Are you still writing the same way? Well, no, not so much. I'm. <clears throat> I'm still an early riser. I get up about this with the sun and very rarely before the sun. 
But uh, what I don't do is immediately you know, put on the coffee pot and start writing. Uh, partly fandom is to blame. Uh, <laughs> you know, quite frankly, one reason is success. I don't have to knock myself out and get another book written. Uh, for many years, I did have to. And now I, uh, I, I still love writing. I enjoy writing and I enjoy the social life uh, that surrounds the writing game. But uh, I don't have these strong ambitions uh, that I had when I was younger. And I guess this happens to a lot of 75-year-old people. Uh, I'm content just to do it and be glad that I can do it well enough, uh, even in my advanced years. Uh, I don't, I, what, I guess, since I have a mantle piece, a mantle full of uh, rocket ships, what, do I want another one? I don't even know how many I've got. <laughs> uh, she said that many. Five rocket ships. Five, I think it's got to be more than that. Such, 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 a, such a hardship. Yeah. yeah it's rough. It's rough. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have a question from Leslie, but before I ask her to unmute and say her question, um, Gay, you, I think you've uh, been the business manager. Yeah. You certainly are the one with all of the, the schedules and the timelines and the, the juggling of things. Can you say a few words about that part of your life? Yeah, I sort of lucked in. We discovered that I was a detail person and he was not. So he would get a request and it would sit there. So I sort of took it over and uh, I answered the mail and I schedule the conventions and um, I make sure that things get done, that need to get done because I'm the detail person. And I don't think I could write, I couldn't write a novel if I had to. Um, but I love watching the process and how it's done. And I agented for a while, uh, one of his students, oh, wonderful Bill. One of Joe's students is Bill Johnson, who wrote a Hugo winning uh, story called We Will Drink a Fish Together. Joe won a Hugo sitting on one side of me for his novel Camouflage and Bill won a Hugo for um, We Will Drink a Fish at the 1996, convention was it anyway they're both on either side of me bill um i agented for bill in the sense of sending out his short stories because he wouldn't send them and very soon analog and asimov's published almost everything that i sent him so he had a little career he just passed away a few weeks ago and and we're gonna miss him a lot so keep bill johnson and his family in your thoughts he has finished a novel and uh, we were working on it, and it, I don't know what's going to happen to it, but we're going to try to publish it. I think you were also coaching uh, Judy uh, Castro on how to be the business manager for Adam. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's been a while since we did that. Yes, we did talk about that. So I have done panels only, on that. Yeah, not and, only do you civilize people, but you also educate them into the, to the um, supporting uh, parts of the craft. We try. There's a, a writers need a much bigger support system than they know about, and if they don't have that, it can be hard. So I'm the support system here. Absolutely. Okay, Leslie, if you would, would you please unmute yourself and ask your question? You know, I don't know that I actually met you at Tricon, but I do remember seeing you on the stage of the masquerade. <laughs> <laughs> And that was yeah. my world time. Um, oh. You know, because writers in science fiction are so social with each other, at least they were in my era. I'm wondering if there are newer writers, people who started writing in this current century that you've enjoyed meeting or reading. Oh, yeah. N.K. Jemison is delightful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> names again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wonderful people. Um, yes, lots of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, hey, I who's the woman who just, uh, I just finished a very good book by, uh, yeah, that woman. Uh, her and, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh dear, that's terrible. Yes, we do. Oh, I read 
Al mm -hmm. almost all the nominees every time so I can keep up with who's new and everything. Uh, we got to know um, Nora Jemison at, uh, at a, the, a workshop called Launchpad in Denver. No. Uh, Wisconsin. Sorry, Wyoming. Wyoming. Right. And uh, it's a wonderful uh, to teaching teaching writers how to do science. And Joe was one of the one of the speakers, and we got to meet her. And then she suddenly won three Hugo's in a row for novel, which is I think unheard of. Just wonderful, and she's good. I like her stuff a lot. Big fan of um, Mary Doria Russell. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think who, who other people that are. Oh, names, names. <laughs> Probably a woman with three names. <laughs> well, Sorry, that's I what these you. these things are. We put you on the spot with unexpected things. Oh, I uh, like that question. The, um, <laughs> you said you're still going to be going to um, conventions, so I hope we get to see you. Uh, at one of them yeah. sometime soon. Uh, and uh, are you going to Shikon? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll see you there. Great. Good, good. World Fantasy will be at World Fantasy, which is in New Orleans. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and so I will be uh, at Icon and I was in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we have a question from Rich Lynch, or rather a request. He says, ask Joe to describe his meeting with Heinlein in 1976. Oh, let's see. That one was uh, when I won, had, the, had the Hugo. Yeah, uh, it was the Hugo or the Nebula. I wasn't there when you met Heinlein. I don't remember why. I, uh, I think the first time I met Heinlein was actually at a, a Nebula conference, uh, rather the awards presentation. I think that was it. And he came across the hall to shake my hand for having won for the, uh, the Forever War. And I was much blown away by that. You know, he was uh, a very courtly and uh, dignified man. Uh, I didn't know him fanishly at all. I mean, one doesn't. But uh, we, got to, we got along very well. Oddly enough, our, our politics, of course, are diametrically opposed Not in many completely. things. But when did that ever make any difference in fandom? I mean, I guess sometimes for some people it does, but for me it doesn't. And uh, I, I accept that many of the people whom I respect uh, have the weirdest ideas. <laughs> That's okay. But... I didn't think most of Heinlein's ideas were strange at all because he and I are both Midwestern uh, technological education, uh, white male guys, and we both <laughs> had military backgrounds, which is not common in science fiction. So yeah, we belong to a pretty small club anyhow, but even if you don't look at our publication records, and then the fact is, we both liked each other's work, which is uh, kind of a strong thing among writers. <laughs> he, without him, I think we Joe wouldn't have even had a career without Heinlein's influence. I, he was yeah. so important yeah. to us, and we tried to tell him. I tried to tell him, and he didn't want to hear it. But I did. Yeah. I just so tried so hard, and I corresponded with Ginny for a while. Yeah. About business stuff, trying to get our heads together about how things should work. Why do you think Heinlein didn't want to hear that? He he kept shutting us down as we tried to. I mean, he wasn't. It, I don't know. Was making him uncomfortable. I remember yeah. that trying yeah. to tell him you were so important to us, and he just yeah. okay, okay, okay. Well, he was he was not self-effacing, but he didn't want to take credit for anybody's work. You know? Yeah. So no conversation is is complete without a Harlan Ellison story, at least for the next for the next twenty years. Yeah, I'll keep it short. <laughs> Oh, oh, I was going to ask about a particular one and see if you remembered. I was at a conference on the Fantastic where you and Harlan were both there. And I remember being in a square room with the tables arranged around the edges. And Harlan was holding forth and holding forth. And you were in the room. And at one point, you decided that you were tired of him um, being the center of attention and, and, and trying to do that. And you 
uh, engaged. And it was brilliant repartee and, and the rest of us just sat there stunned. It was so good. It was the one where he asked everyone, he went around the room and asked everyone what made them special. And uh, it was, it was strange. I wondered if you even remember that and what it felt like from your side. No, I wonder what I thought was, I had that was special. Oh, I don't remember what you said. Sure, I was just trying to figure out mine. I have met Harlan Ellison. Who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it wasn't that your response was was um, that striking. It's that you did not let him monopolize the room. You oh, yeah. you gave as good as as you got, and you no, no. gave as good or better than he did. It was it was really um, very spectacular. Sorry, well, you don't I, remember it. Well, it's I've got to say now, unlike a lot of people, I really, really liked Harlan. And I forgave him his trespasses, let us say. I mean, he <laughs> he was not an easy man to be a friend with, but we got along pretty well. Probably living on opposite coasts helped. Yeah, that's right. He, he wouldn't call me up and say, you know. But he did. Joe wrote a little thing where um, he said, uh something about oh it was it, joe had to write us a, a syllabus for a science fiction oh, yeah. class for iowa for iowa for one of his classes or for oh, i guess to get your degree you had to mm -hmm. write this thing and in it he mentioned that uh dangerous visions um and made some comment about maybe not so dangerous yeah and mike glickson published this in his fancy an argument right and he read it and decided that he was being insulted <laughs> and wrote Joe the nastiest letter. It was just, it was full of invective and it was really nasty. And Joe was kind of puzzled because, it, you know, he used the book in the syllabus. He was going to use the book. So uh, Joe took the letter and, and Joe wrote back and said, I don't argue on this level, which pushed Harlan's buttons. And he wrote another nastier letter. And we're, we're getting kind of amused at this. So Joe sits down. And he takes that letter and he answers everything. And he says, you know, this, this is, you know, I could try this, but it's kind of anatomically impossible. <laughs> and, and, and he took every insult and gently answered it. So we got no answer to that letter. About three months later, we go to a nebula, I think in Los Angeles, and we see Harlan across the room and Harlan sees Joe. And he comes bouncing across the seats in the auditorium to shake Joe's hand. Yeah. And that was it. The end of the feud. Yeah. That sounds like Harlan. Yeah. yeah it was so. so strange. I must dig those letters out. I've got those. And, and quite a bit different than the um, courtly uh, gallantry that you got from Heinlein. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there were, there were some writers like Heinlein and uh, Sprague de Camp and Sterling Lanier, who um, really used to keep that formal uh, feel that um, maybe was more 40s, even yeah. in, in 50s. And um, I'm not sure that we have that anymore, but maybe, um, you know some other science fiction authors who uh, had that kind of uh, personality. Nowadays, nowadays I can't think of anybody. Uh, a couple of people associated with the uh, Fort Lauderdale group are uh, as authors. You mean authors who are sort of academic and refined people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, see, in the other direction from the famous type. Uh, I don't know that because I'm I'm insulated by my own fame. I I don't Ooh, meet yeah. people uh, on a level playing field anymore. That's Ooh. true. So yeah, it's just I meet, and I meet them, but uh, uh, not uh, in a combative way. Well, anyway, does anyone else have any other questions? Come on now. I say combatively. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there anything that you want to talk about that you weren't asked? 
Oh, good question. Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have in front of me. <laughs> Tools of the writer. I have. I'm not even writing, and I've got five fountain pens here. How many of you have five fountain pens in front of you <laughs> in a hotel room? Huh? <laughs> I mean, that's a sign of and for six. There's one of them. It, uh, it sounds like you need to sit down and um, write out a manuscript by hand. <laughs> or, or see a psychiatrist about this compulsion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite means of writing? Do you use a computer? Do you handwrite it? Do you still type on a typewriter? You know, I mostly write it in with a fountain pen. Uh, I'm on a computer because you've got to be on a computer. You know, I, I sit down in the morning I normally, uh, oh yeah, and I, I have these little. Oh, little, nice. I like to draw as well as write. And, uh, oh, she's got one there, yeah. Oh, I just have one after this. Oh, that's a nice one, yeah. I like this one. And he wrote. Oh. <laughs> do, you put, do you put any of your art in the art shows? Yeah. No, not too anymore. Too much trouble. It's, it's too much hassle, and, and uh, if I win, People say, well, that's just because he's a famous writer. <laughs> so, that's not true. Writing's pretty good. Yeah. So it, it's easy to transcribe. And I like notebooks. So I collect notebooks and fill them with words. <laughs> oh, that's just. I'm just looking on the desk. I've got three right here. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask if uh, you guys are reading any of the current fanzines. Including the uh, the uh, ones that get nominated for Hugo's, which are uh, all almost all our, our blogs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We haven't been good about that. We no, should we be should. Good, better about that. Every now and then, if somebody sends me one, I'll read it uh, and enjoy it. Yeah, and very much enjoy it. Uh, people aren't as uh, enthusiastic about sending around fanzines, especially to writers, other than other bloggers and other you know, fan people. But I read File 770 and I mm -hmm. read um, uh, uh, David Lanford's Ansible uh, and we, we're subscribers to Locus and try to read it yeah. each month. And well, it's not a fancy. You know, I, I will read both Locus and Ansible immediately as soon as they come in yeah. because I like the illusion of being connected to uh, science fiction fandom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, we got any other questions? Well, we, we do, we do. So uh, Natalie, would you please unmute and ask your question? Hi. <laughs> um, Hi, Natalie. I'm sure you've been asked this um, a lot, <laughs> but um, did you receive a lot of like backlash for how you wrote about women's roles in the military in the Forever War? Um, I'm just curious because I don't know. I'm a veteran, and uh, I was in an infantry unit, and I was gifted at the time um, Orson Scott cards, Ender's Game, <laughs> and I think it was supposed to be a, a kind gift, like, "Hey, you'll, you love sci-fi, you love <laughs> yeah, the military, right. you'll yeah. you'll like this." And um, I remember it just like enraging me, like I couldn't believe that this was. Yeah, I couldn't believe what I was reading at the time, and it made me so angry. And it, it became a big argument between me and the person I like gifted, and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> like how, like women, you know, I, I'm sure you've read it. You know how he, what he thinks of uh, women in the military. And um, right. when I came upon your book, um, it it meant a lot to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I just loved it. I just loved it so much. And it meant so much to hear an author and a veteran, um, you know, accepting women's place in the military and oh, what they are capable of. And I just was curious if you had any thoughts about that um, oh, writing or if, if, yeah, I don't know, if you received backlash. I don't, I get front lash. <laughs> You know, in an odd way. I uh, like Orson Scott Card and I have been friends for a hundred years, and we sort of agreed to disagree 
about the time we were born. We have, <laughs> I don't think we've ever agreed on anything. Uh, yeah. At least English language, we both agree, is a good one for writing books. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's an interesting combination because he and I are almost the same age. And uh, we've both been writing about the same length of time. We both are, I wouldn't say, I, I guess he's more successful than I am, but we're about the same part of the universe. And it's funny because we have nothing in common. I mean, absolutely. I won't say fucking, but absolutely almost <laughs> nothing. And so, and yet we really get along. We were instant pals. And uh, it's just part of the... Uh, the science fiction writer's code, if there is such a thing, you you expect other science fiction writers to be kind of nuts. And uh, okay, so this one is one of the nuts. All right. And you just keep going. Uh, and I'm sure he feels the same way about me or even worse. I don't know. Could I talk to this? <laughs> oh, gay, gay, has, gay knows the inside dope. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, the main character in the Forever War is Mary Gay Potter, which was me, my name. <laughs> And um, he, she's not me, but the first serious feminist criticism of that book that we saw was an academic undergraduate paper. And the poor woman had to give this paper in front of Joe and it <laughs> criticized some of the, it was at, at uh, the Air Force Academy. Yeah. And it criticized some things about the women in the book. This woman cried very easily, this, you know, stuff like that. And everything mm -hmm. she criticized was my personality, yeah. everything was. And which, it just, it, I got really tickled at it actually. Which proves that if Gay had tried to get into the Air Force Academy or any of the academies, he would have been kicked out. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> he got more flack for the homosexuality toward the end. He isn't getting it very much anymore. The gay community at one point said there should have been more of it, but, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, some people criticized him for that. And I agree now with that criticism because mm -hmm. a lot of the homosexual behavior, if you want to put that in big fat quotes, in the forever war is based on my own ignorance of, uh, of actual uh, homosexual social life. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's just what I knew and I tried to write honestly about what I knew, but I honestly mm -hmm. didn't know shit. <laughs> so there you go. And it was to isolate his main character yeah, as true. a straight man among in a in a gay society. So uh, it, it worked, I thought, on that level. Yeah. Um, but that it was 1970, the early 70s, and things were a lot different than they are. Yeah, now. and it's all written in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And in fact, was... uh, the people, the homosexual friends I had who read it, thought it was pretty forgiving and uh, and honest. Uh, but then, I don't know, I didn't have very many fanatic friends one way or the other. Uh, I think I, I met, I have met people who thought that I was just too friendly with, uh, with gay people and, you know, go figure. I mean, yeah, there's a world where homosexuality is the norm. And so all the normal people are gay. <laughs> but some people would explode at that. Yeah. We, we do have a question from Kurt Phillips. Kurt, would you please um, Hello, Kurt. mute? Yeah. Hi, Kurt. Unmuted. There, now I'm unmuted. Yay. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, I've enjoyed this uh, hour and a half uh, tremendously. And um, first, I'd like to just make a comment. I think I first met the two of you through our mutual friend, Rusty, many oh. years ago. and. Uh, to me, the two of you exemplify the very best of the science fiction community. I mean, you're some of the best people I know in, in science fiction, and I've always enjoyed seeing you at every convention that I've gone to. Uh, I remember being at LUNCON 3 a few years ago, and it was my first time out of the country, in fact, Ooh, and wow. felt a little bit, you know, fish out of water being in a foreign country. But I looked around the convention hall and saw the two of you there. I thought, well, oh, this is a convention. It's Joe, there's Joe and Gay there. So everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, we get to do that again sometime. Yeah. Um, yeah. My question is uh, for you, Joe. Um, are we going to be seeing any new uh, Haldeman fiction in the coming months, weeks, years? 
Yes, in fact, I've, uh, I'm starting a new book <clears throat> very soon. I'm writing it with a friend, uh, Rick Wilbur. Oh, yeah. He and I got together and just, we always hit it off really well. And mm -hmm. Rick is more ambitious than I am in some ways. And he says, well, why don't we just get a place down on the water somewhere <laughs> and sit down and write a book? And it's not that simple, of course. I mean, you do have to find paper and a pencil and so forth. But uh, we decided we're going to do this. And starting when is it? Uh, uh, this week. They're just, going to Cedar Key, Florida, and sit there for 10 days and see if it's going to work or not. Yeah. Wow. And then we'll see. I. It's funny because Rick belongs to the 21st century. And he uses computers and things. Mm -hmm. I'll have to learn how to do that, too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> He's also one of my favorite writers. Yeah. I, I highly recommend Rick oh, He's, he's a really fun writer, yeah. Oh, I discovered his Alien, I think it's Alien Morning, the first of his Alien trilogy. Uh, really good. A year or so ago. Terrific book. I'm really looking forward to this, uh, what you and he uh, come up with. I, this is the first time hearing about it, and I think it's great news. First sure. time he's talked about it. So yeah. this is, whether anything comes of it, we don't know yet. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that's coming. Joe's writing a bunch of poetry. He's got three poems coming out in Asimov's. Mm -hmm. uh, two, po I mean, two poems coming out in Asimov's over the next few months. I don't know when. But nothing else because he took some time off. He's retired. I am a retiring, shy retiring person. <laughs> yes. But Rick may get him writing hard again. Yeah. We'll see. We don't have any okay. other questions in the chat. Then... Um... Joe, Gay, um, thank you very much for your time and talking with us. And um, if we come up with um, more questions, we may ask you them. But um, other than that, it was a pleasure to see you guys again and, and talk with you. Thank yes, you indeed. so much. This was so much fun. Yeah. We'll have to do this again sometime. <laughs> okay. <laughs>